we're here today today. with Derek Jensen. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, Bright Green Lies. Uh, Congratulations on the book and uh, Julia Barnes's movie. Um, I just watched the premiere and it was very, very moving. I still haven't read the book, but it's uh, it's on the way. Um, So congratulations on both of those. And we've already spoken to Leah Keith um, about the book. Uh, So uh, yeah, Derek, I must say that the movie was moving enough for me. I actually cried, (laughs) which is, Pretty, I'm a pretty jaded old dude, and uh, I, movies don't often get to me. But uh, one of the, the places that really got to me was um, when you talked personally about uh, Crohn's disease and how you really have skin in the game when you say that uh, you rely on tech civilization for your life. And, you know, in essence, you were saying you would cash it in to see tech civilization go. Am I reading you right? And is that is that the way it is? <clears throat> well, thanks for saying that. And uh, thank you for all of your kind words about that. And thank you for, for having me here today. And yeah, I was actually just thinking about this last night that um, um, I, I mean, all of us are going to die and I mean, I don't, I, I love life and I'm having a wonderful life and that doesn't alter the fact that I'm going to die someday and, um, and the forest isn't supposed to. I'm supposed to. The dogs here at my feet are supposed to. The bears outside are supposed to. The trees are eventually supposed to, individually. Um, I read this really interesting book <clears throat> um, a few years ago called 13 Moons by Charles Frazier. He's the guy who wrote Dark Mountain, which made was made into a big movie and everything. Anyway, the, the, the book 13 Moons was, was, it was sort of a love story. Well, it was a love story between a man and a woman, which was okay. But there was also a love story between the protagonist and the land that I found really moving. I loved it. I would love to interview him about that. And it's set in North Carolina from 1820 to 1900. And at the beginning of the, the book, there's uh, still wolves and the, uh, the buffalo have just been exterminated in North Carolina. And by the end of the book, there's a train goes right by his house every day carrying forests east and tourists west. And he has this great soliloquy near the end where he talks about, you know, he's 80 years old and his, his lover has died. All of his lovers have died. His and he says, this is what happens in life. And we evolved with this, that your parents are going to die, your older siblings are going to die, your aunts and uncles are going to die, your friends are going to start dying. And if you last a long time, you know, you're going to be the last one standing and, and then you'll die. And there, that, that sorrow is part of life. And I've seen bears who lose their cubs grieving. You know, this is just part of life. He says, but what, we're, what we didn't evolve with is we didn't evolve with having the entire forest that is our home being killed. We don't know where to put that grief. So somebody living in the 16th century in North Carolina, individual trees would die, individual bears would die, individual humans would die, but the forest remains. There is that stability. And, um, you know, where I live, I live on land that was the Talo Indians. And I'm not saying they were perfect. And the Talo wouldn't say they were perfect. They were just like everybody else. They got their problems. But it's known that they lived here for 12,500 years. And something they could count on is the salmon would come back every year. The salmon will be here. In fact, there will be multiple runs of salmon every year that is something upon which you can absolutely rely. And so it's just, um, somebody in in a review of one of my books early on, I don't read reviews anymore, but back when I was 
a sweet summer child and would still read reviews, um, my uh, uh, somebody said something that I don't know if they meant it as a compliment or not, but I took it as one of the best compliments I've ever gotten about my work was that they said that I was almost pathologically unsentimental. And I'm not that they didn't if they would have said pathologically unemotional, I would have been really offended because that's just that's just just wrong. But I think I am kind of almost pathologically unsentimental in that um, you know, I'm gonna die someday and that's life, which doesn't mean that I won't fight like hell. I want to tell one more story, um, which is one day I was sitting by a, a pond with two dogs and three cats, and a rat walked up to us, and my dog started to chase the rat, and the rat stood there facing them, and then froze, not froze, but um, at the last moment, its courage broke, and it swam across the pond, and I saw it get out, on, and I yelled at the dogs to stop, and that's that's actually why the rat got away. And when the the rat got to the other side of the pond, it sw it crawled out, and I could see that it could barely walk. And I suddenly realized that I had done a terrible thing. And I, I, I don't mind holding dogs back from killing squirrels or anything else. That's, I'm not talking about that. But in this case, why would a rat walk up to a human, two dogs, and three cats? Well, it was ready to go. And, um, and then at the last moment, it lost its nerve, as any of us would if you have these giant jaws coming after you. So I think, you know, me saying, yeah, I'm going to die someday doesn't mean that if somebody came in with a knife right now that I wouldn't fight like hell. It just means, yeah, ultimately I'm going to die and, um, and the world's more important than I am. And sorry if that was on too long for this. No, that, I, I do appreciate what you say about sentimentality. And I, yeah, what comes across in the movie is your depth of feeling and Leah's and Julia's as well and Max's. Um, it, but it's a quiet, quietly stated feeling. And it kind of reminds me of the maturity of, you know, indigenous people. If I think of kind of Native Americans and stuff, or tribal people, they have this kind of lack of sentimentality and a kind of maturity that's, uh, that I think comes across in, in all of you. It doesn't come across to everybody. We tried to post, uh, we, we tried to promote the movie and the book as much as possible, but we get a lot of resistance on social media. Um, and one thing surprised me, I, uh, you know, especially because I live on, you know, the sea, the bits about the sea uh, got to me uh, quite in quite a big way. And I was genuinely surprised that some people came back and said, you know, this doesn't have enough references. This isn't well researched. And so I thought like, boy, you have, you have no heart. <laughs> and I realized that for many people, they have lost uh, that heart to the extent that they can't see your connection, the obvious connection that's so obvious <laughs> to everybody, I think, in, in our group, that has a connection to nature, that that everybody involved in the movie, the deep, deep passion and love of nature, understated, comes across without sentimentality. And I was a kind of appalled that 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 could pass people by. I, I mean, we're talking neon greens and the bright greens that you that you're making the movie about. What have you encountered any of that yet because i think you probably will <laughs> yeah well a couple things first off um i guess that's a fundamental flaw in the film is that we didn't provide footnotes at the bottom of the screen like they do in every other documentary i mean it's just like not titanic james cameron he he put nice subtitles and, and the, yeah just his references yeah yeah you put all your references at the bottom of the screen in fact, you put you put the action down at the bottom of the screen. You put the footnotes up top. It's it's ridiculous. If if they if they don't like the lack of citations in the movie, they should read the book because we got the citations in the book. In fact, that's what I told them. them. Yeah, I told them. <laughs> yeah, and and so far as the other, yes, we're getting this in spades already. That the the any time we say anything about 
wind or solar, they accuse us of being, obviously, this means you work for the oil industry, and which is really funny because, you know, my first degree was in mineral engineering physics from the Colorado School of Mines, which is an energy school. It's one of the best energy schools in the world. And um, my friends in college literally were either running their own oil companies or senior VPs at major oil companies by the late 90s. And so they they have figured out my nefarious plan. My nefarious plan was I would get this degree and instead of working directly for the oil industry, I would become a beekeeper and make a little bit of money writing through my 20s and average less than 10,000 a year. And in my 30s, I got about 10,000 a year because I was working as an adjunct professor and then I started to get paid off with about 15,000 a year through writing in my 2000s. And it's all so I can eventually score with this book, which will probably make us a total of about 15,000 each or 10,000 each. I mean, it's just a nefarious plan. I mean, it's just crazy that, I mean, that's the accusation that comes out or you know, the, the, the real issue is not what the accusations are. The real issue is that bright green is, is really a religion. It's a faith-based. I just saw this article yesterday. It's so funny. I want to I wanna see if I can find this real fast. It, it just, the guy was so close to getting it. And then uh, our civilization is dying because it's addicted to fossil fuels. And this guy writes this article. And he's so close to getting it. He talks about how wind and solar won't work uh, because they are not functionally, uh, you can't substitute them functionally for oil. And then it's like, yeah, you're getting it. They won't work. They won't, they don't help the planet. And that's all great until he comes up with his solution, which is uh we need a moonshot for serious, scalable, and clean source of energy now. Um, imagine that there was a tiny box the size of a cube that could provide cheap, clean energy, and its only byproduct was, I don't know, tiny green pellets that animals could eat. We could put the power cubes anywhere, on planes, on ships, replacing all those dirty engine rooms. We could put them in the heart of all those power plants that still run on dirty energy. We could use them to synthesize organic chemicals and fertilizer. We could use them to forge steel and form concrete and bake glass. That's what we need to save our civilization. It's like, seriously, his solution is not to recognize the physical limits of the planet, but to, quote, imagine that there was a tiny box the size of a cube that could provide cheap, clean energy. You know, I don't know whether this is a better or worse idea than thinking you can run your economy on unicorn farts or, um, or as Lear said in the book, the technological equivalent of wishing on a star. And like pixie dust, yeah, techno pixie dust. That's exactly what it is. And it's just, it's, I mean, I really, I firmly believe in applying the medical rhetoric to other issues that, you know, when, when, I found out I had Crohn's disease. A doctor came in and said, I'm sorry, the biopsy came back and it's not ulcerative colitis, it's Crohn's. And then he left the room and, you know, let me cry about it for an hour. And then a nurse came in and we talked. And likewise with the coronary artery disease, I went in for an angiogram and the doctor said, I'm sorry, you're not leaving the hospital. Um, we're going to schedule you for open heart surgery. And they didn't say, go on home and let's invent a magic cube that'll fix everything. It's like, let's, I have a good doctor friend, John Osborne, who's my environmental mentor, dear, dear friend. And he always says, um, correct diagnosis is a first step toward proper treatment. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about, you know, a sprained ankle or or industrial quantities of energy that are harming the planet, it still would make sense 
to keep an open mind and to gather data and then go wherever that data leads you. This is one of the things that just kills me about environmental issues in general is that we have this, we have all, you know, none of my work is cognitively challenging at all because all I'm doing is looking at patterns and seeing where they're going. And if you have a way of life that's based on using non-renewable resources, it won't last. And if you have a way of life that decreases renewable resources such that there are uncountable salmon, and then you can count them, and then there's 5 million, and then there's 1 million, and then there's 500,000, and then there's 100,000, that's, that's a trend. And I don't understand how, I honestly don't understand how, especially given what's at stake, more people don't see these trends. It's just extraordinary to me. And when you do point out the trends, I mean, you point out that electric, the, the solar photovoltaics require mining and mining, they require materials that come from somewhere and that somewhere was someone's home and the fabrication of those materials uh, causes various harms and then they get mad at you for simply pointing that out. That's that's what just that's that's one of the things that I find really striking is I don't I mean simply pointing out that windmills, the wind energy facilities um, cause a pressure drop that will pulverize, will 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 destroy the eardrums and explode the hearts of bats, simply pointing that fact out, instead of people saying, no, it won't, and then giving numbers, or saying, wow, that's really horrible, let's do something about it, they say, you must be working for the, the oil industry. It just, that's, that makes no sense to me. I don't, I mean, so the doctor comes in, and and I don't know, I don't know, it's just, it, I don't really work that way. And I, I feel like I'm rambling, so ask me whatever you want. If, uh, if I can, if, if I may say something about the doctor's work, you say that um, the good work, the good doctor's work, is to get a good diagnosis and apply a good treatment. One of the big, one of the big uh, basis of a treatment is etiology and causes. And uh, you, are, you are very, very prolific in in uh, analyzing those causes with all the references that you have in all your books. You come when it comes to the. To our group, we, we talk a lot about causes, but we're not going to go on to this this evening. We talk a lot about the, the human mind and the human brain and why we are coming to the situation we are now. But um, in, in your solutions um, and your treatment, in your book, you mention a soft landing. You mention a kind of prepping. You mention also, of course, like we think that civilization has to go. So, so. Uh, as a religion, you know it has to go. Uh, I would like to to hear your your uh, your your voice on this. What what have you to say about uh, about soft landing about about solutions? <laughs> um, well, the first thing about soft landing is it ain't gonna happen. Um, I, every cell in my body wants for it to, and technically, technically we could. We could, if we if we were approaching this, this is one of the things that really frustrates the sort of scientific part of me, is that if we were using our cleverness to figure out ways to have a soft landing, then I think there are all sorts of technical things we could do that could be actually pretty helpful. But since the technical things since energy use is continuing to go up every year, the technical things are being put to the wrong end. Um, <clears throat> and a, a fun example from the book is that, <clears throat> and if you want, I can go go get you some and you can see the little mealworms. I have 15 little containers of mealworms, shoebox size containers of mealworms, um, because I, I love insects and I um, I read maybe 10 years ago that mealworms, darkling beetles, can digest styrofoam. 
And I thought, well, that'll be fun. So I just bought some that otherwise would have been fed to lizards. And um, I feed them lettuce because they need some water. And I feed them some wheat germ, but mainly uh, styrofoam. And they eat it. They've been going for 10 years on this and making, I went from one little container to 15 shoeboxes. So they're obviously expanding. And so I've fantasized, I'll tell you why this fantasy won't work, but I've fantasized about setting one of these up on an industrial level. So you like have this giant room filled with mealworms, everybody brings their styrofoam in and then they eat it all and they, uh, and then they produce eventually dead mealworm bodies and, uh, and poop, insect poop is called frass. And I, I then, I wasn't sure if they were, if the frat, if the, if the insects had completely digested the styrofoam, maybe they just broke it down, used some of it, but it wasn't available. So I took their poop and I put it on various house plants and I put it outside. The stuff I put outside was eaten overnight. Don't know by whom. And the stuff on the house plants, uh, fungus came and covered it within a day or two and it ate it all up. So this is really cool. I'm actually converting this eye, the mealworms, are converting the styrofoam into usable food for other beings. It's pulling styrofoam into the food chain. Makes me so happy. And then I read that, as with all animals, about 80% of the carbon that they uh, ingest is actually exhaled as carbon dioxide. Same thing happens with you. You eat, you know, a bunch of lettuce or a bunch of steak. It doesn't matter. You eat, you eat carbon. Um, most of it comes out of your mouth as carbon dioxide, um, 80%. And so actually what I'm really doing is converting styrofoam into atmospheric carbon. Shoot. Which doesn't alter the fact. So then I had this other idea just a week ago. What happens if you put this industrial size styrofoam conversion factory consisting of mealworms, what if you put it in with a room full of plants? Then the plants are converting it back. So my point is that if we were trying for a soft landing, it would be really fun, I think, to figure out technical ways that we could attempt to, to decrease the harm that's being done while you know, humans slowly step down their harm. But it ain't going to happen. And the reason it's, it's like in the book, we talk about um, solutions to overpopulation, which primarily consist of giving women absolute reproductive freedom, because right now, 50% of the children in the world are either unplanned or unwanted. And they found that simply teaching little girls to read gives them enough, uh, liberates them enough. Just that by itself liberates them enough. They usually have fewer children. So, 50% decrease in birth rates through just educating, giving giving girls an education. It's like, that's great, except, well, of course, what this means is we'd have to take on the Abrahamic religions and also patri our civilization's growth, or capitalism's growth imperative. Because what happens when Russia or Japan starts to have a declining birth rate? They all freak out. So they're not having enough babies and they have sex holidays where the people are supposed to go home and have sex and have babies nine months later. So... The point is that even something as straightforward as that, even straightforward and pro-human rights as that. Um, oh, and here's another problem with the soft landing idea. There was a study a few years ago. Young people, I think in the UK, they asked them, if you have a choice between access to sunlight and Wi-Fi, which will you choose? And it was Wi-Fi overwhelmingly. And... This really gets to the heart of the whole bright green question is, you know, we talk in the book about Naomi Klein, Bill McKibben, David Suzuki, and so on and so on. And we're not attacking them. They, they are all working very, very hard. We're not attacking their morals. We're not, we're not saying they're bought out. We're not saying any of that. What we're saying is we have a different value system than they do because they're trying to save this way of life and we're trying to save the living planet. And that's why we won't have 
a uh, a soft landing is because there aren't enough of us who want to save the living planet. So I'll, you got your hand up. I'll stop rambling. Oh, Sophie, were you going to ask? No, I would thank you. Thank you. No, Hugh, or maybe you want to introduce uh, something else, There's some other oh. topic uh, in liaison with the end of the end of uh, civilized or well, of industrialized civilization. Which is oh yeah, I can, I, can, I can tell you a very quick way to get a soft landing. So the the main thing about all these kind of solutions, these engineered solutions, is I don't think we've got time. You know, the the Arctic's going to be ice free. They say before twenty thirty, but it, it, the observational Arctic scientists right. say before twenty twenty five, right? And things are going to unravel very fast. So a lot of the Permaculture solutions, the off-grid solutions, parallel polar kind of communities. I don't think they're going to work. But there is one, one easy way, very easy way uh, to, to get a soft landing. And all you have to do is just pass a law that eliminates date and time from all contracts and agreements. It's not easy to see why and how that would work. It takes a little bit of time and explanation to to work it through, but it would, uh, yeah, it would basically bring industrial civilization to a gentle stop and and quite quickly. It takes a while to explain it. So <laughs> we haven't really got time here, but that that would actually do what engineering can't can't do. Uh, the only I think it would only make sense if uh, if you you know understood if you've been in commercial arena and you've uh, been in like entrepreneurial you know situations in the states and so you need to know a little bit about law and a little bit about the capitalist economy and growth and, and yeah it's it's all predicated on time if you if you ban the use of date and time in a contract it it would all naturally wind down the whole industrial system would wind down quite naturally. And the, one of the main reasons is you couldn't uh, specify debt. You couldn't actually, you know, have a bond with a regular coupon or premium uh, because you, you, without being able to say date and time or period and time, you wouldn't be able to specify an interest period. And if you can't specify an interest period, then basically people wouldn't be able to grow. So the, the the growth economy is really predicated on debt. I don't think a lot of people know that. A few yeah. people that know that are economists, and they they have the you know they they like Nordhaus, and they, they think we can go to three degrees Celsius and still be fine, and the ocean can die, and as long as we have fish farms, that's okay. And so the economists look are not environmentalists, but they 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 would understand this, and I think environmentalists don't understand this because they're not business people. But the, if you if you if you if you'd like me some other time to go through it, they, it is just a simple change to the law, just a, almost a one line change. <laughs> that would be. Is the short version of this that um, you ask me to loan you a hundred bucks, and I can still do that under the new law. It's just I can't say you need to pay me by September first, and you need to pay me one hundred twelve. I can say you need to pay me one hundred twelve for the hundred bucks you borrow, but we can't specify time, which means you could do it six years from now, or eight years from now, or a hundred years from now if you want. And then, of course, nobody would loan money under those circumstances. Um, exactly. Exactly. So you could loan money. I mean, it wouldn't be impossible. You know, just think about it. I could. I could say, you know, Derek, here's a hundred bucks. Um, I'll give you two hundred, but you have to pay pay me back a hundred and twenty first. And uh, then it would be entirely up to you <laughs> whether you whether you paid it back well, ever or whether you paid. Yeah. The interesting thing is that's actually how it works with friends. Yeah, it, it, it is a, it's what indigenous people do. It's it's a Wester system. It's it is in fact Islamic financing. In, in in the Islamic world, you're not really allowed to charge interest, and Wester means favor in the, like in, in Egypt. But it is the indigenous thing. It's basically it. You see, they told <laughs> a big lie. All these people, uh, you know. Hobbes and Ricardo and Smith and all these early economists, they told this big lie about, about 
you know, how everything used to be bartered. It was a complete nonsense. It never was. If anthropologists will tell you, no, the system they use is a debt-based system. It's a system of favors. That's traditionally yep. how how humans have actually coexisted for so long is um, potlatching, uh, yep. combining resources, and also just owing favors. So it, it, it goes so far back that they can show that, that monkeys, you know, have an economy. A lot of Franz Duval's work has shown that monkeys have a very sophisticated idea of economics and they keep a tally, a very strict tally of who, <laughs> who groomed who in the, in the troop. And humans used to do that too before civilization. Yeah, a couple things. One is, I completely agree. And that's, you know, if we want, that's how, that's how healthy families work. You know, if, if somebody says, Junior, can you pass the potatoes? He doesn't say it's going to cost you seven dollars. It's like he does it because um, because Junior will be socially shamed if he's being a little jerk and hogging all the potatoes. And it's all built on relationships. One of the problems is that have we talked before about Duncan's number? No. So Duncan's number, I, I think it's Duncan's number. Dun is, Dunbar, sorry, Dunbar's number. Oh, Dunbar's number. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I, I, yeah Robin Dunbar. Dunbar. Yeah, most people, I think, on on in in our group know about Dunbar's number. Yeah, but but, but, but just just explain it briefly, just in case other people don't. Yeah, but recognize that I even got the name wrong, so I'm gonna get everything else wrong probably too. Anyway, um, see, it's not cited. Anyway, um, there's uh. A certain number, 120 people, 150 people, beyond which uh, you can't really have face-to-face uh, -face social interactions with everyone, and um, direct participatory democracy no longer works. Um, and the relation that the, the series of you have to have some other mechanisms in place to. To help people behave um, because it can be you know if you live if you live in a city of eight million people okay so you live you live in a community long-term community of a hundred people we can loan each other stuff we can I can give you eggs you can you can then you know oh it's like years ago um, this is back in the early 90s my friend George Draffin brought me a bought me a printer and I didn't have any money I should have asked you all companies, huh? Anyway, I didn't have any money, and um, I didn't pay him back for like seven years. And then when I finally got some money, I first thing I did with it is pay him his seven hundred bucks or however much it was back. And printers are more expensive then. And um, and if I lived, that's because I was friends with George, and it's like that debt always rankled me. And he never he never once mentioned it. And on the other hand, if we live in a big city of 8 million people, I can, you know, somebody will buy me a printer today. I never see him again. I just change address. I mean, you can, there, there, there can be anonymous. You can't have relationships with 8 million people. And it, it ends up, there are functional problems with, with that that prohibit um, you know, here I'm sort of going a different direction, but people ask me often if I think humans are inherently evil. And I always say, no, I don't think we're evil at all. I think we are, however, inherently contentious. And um, I think that bears are too. I think songbirds are. I think, oh, did we talk about this before? The thing with bats where somebody put a video on bats in their cave in the winter and when they're just all roosting. Yeah, and they would feed each other. Yeah. They're what? They they would feed each other. Well, there's that, but they they also would do audio recordings and then check, compare what was what was being said by the bats to each other with what was happening, and they were able to figure out a bit of the language. And it ends up about half of what they were saying was, "Hey, get out of my space." They were squabbling, and I think everybody squabbles. I don't think there's any problem with that, and but I think it actually serves a an evolutionary purpose that squabbling and Dunbar's number keeps us from and kept us for hundreds of thousands of years 
from getting into two large groups, which are not good for us and not good for the planet and not good for any groups that surround us because now we can conquer them. And not good and, for pandemics. I'm sorry, what? And not good for pandemics. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, disease control, yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, yeah the, if uh, hunter-gatherer groups got to Dunbar's number, they would split off. That was that was common. Yep. But um, yeah, um, Dunbar's number uh, is based on the size. Robin Dunbar based it on the size of the mammal's brain, and it's very robust finding. So if you look at you know social animals from dolphins to wolves to chimpanzees and humans, <coughs> the number of people in the their Dunbar number is closely related to the size of their brains, in in very very strictly. You know, sorry to not stay on topic, but um, that reminds me of this one thing I read in an account. Okay, you know, usually wolf packs are, I don't know, six to 20, let's call it. And I read an early European account um, from Texas. This is back when there were bazillions of prairie dogs and bazillions of buffalo um, of a pack that somebody was describing of like a hundred wolves. And so I've that's the only account I've ever read of a super pack. And I've always wondered, you know, if the person misunderstood and it was actually a whole bunch of them coming together because a whole bunch of sick buffalo or something, or or if there was so much food that that there could be a larger group. I don't know. It's just very interesting to me because that's the only time I've ever heard about a huge pack of wolves. Or, or it could be the opposite. It could be so few. So, so you know, habitat destruction can force force them into, into true. Yeah. Right, right, right. Absolutely. Yeah. The um. Yeah. So, so uh, just on the point of view of how big things can actually get, it's there's an interesting point about Aristotle. So. Aristotle, in his book Ethics, really the first book on ethics. I, in fact, ethics starts with a, a Aristotle, and people think of ethics as like, oh, you know, the Ten Commandments. But Aristotle said <laughs> that ethics were were basically it wasn't ethical for a town to get over five thousand people, and we think, well. What? <laughs> What's the? That's not trolleyology and you know <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Is like, where, where? What's he talking about? And he, you know, he didn't mind slavery. He didn't mind subjugation of women. That was all okay. But five thousand people was immoral. And, but when he explains it, he says that's the. Uh, if you go above that number, even close to that number, then you have to actually get resources from outside the community. So in other words, what you're saying is they're not self-sufficient anymore. <laughs> and that is exactly where we've got to with global industrial civilization. It's basically the, the reason why there's no such thing as a green city in all these fantasies is a city isn't, you know, Manhattan Island. Manhattan Island extends all the way to the Yangtze River with these tendrils of, you know, consumption emission, um, you know, channels that they... I, uh, I honestly don't understand why i don't understand how people with phds in urban planning can't understand that it's not hard where does the poop go where do you get the bricks oh this this there's a a, a conversation i had with with i was getting interviewed by this guy from nature magazine i love this story he was um He's a dedicated Marxist who believes you can have industrial civilization where no work, no one is exploited anywhere. It's all purely voluntary exchanges. And I said, okay, great. Do you have cities? He said, yeah, we have big cities. I said, great. So how do you get around your city? He said, bus. I said, great. What's the bus made of? He said, uh, metal. I said, great. Where do you get the metal? He said, from mines. I said, great. How do you get people to work in the mines? He said, you pay them a lot, and it's a worker-owned mine. I said, well, mining is one of the worst ways to live on the planet, and it's it's miserable existence, one of the first forms of slavery, but I'm going to give you that one. On the other hand, every single hard rock mine on the planet pollutes groundwater and rivers. So 
what do you do about the people who live on the river? He says, you, you tell them to move. I said, what if they won't? You pay them a lot of money. Well, what if they won't accept it? He said, you pay them more. I said, well, what if their ancestors are buried on this land? They've lived there for 5,000 years, and they refuse to move. They will not leave their ancestors. He said, how many of them are there? I said, I don't know, 400. He said, well, the million people in the city vote, and they vote that those 400 people have to leave the, have to leave the river. And then you go kick them off. And I said, so what you're telling me is that within less than a minute, you have moved from purely voluntary exchanges to democratic empire, land theft from indigenous people, and genocide, all so you can have a bus. They didn't get it. Um, but the point is, it's all really straightforward. This is something that just frustrates me about all this stuff, is that, yes, I love what you just said about New York City extends to the Yangtze River. Absolutely. And I feel this is one of the things about all this work that makes me crazy, is that this is not secret. This is not like top secret that somebody had to sneak into the Pentagon to discover this. And for God's sake, they literally put the poop from New York City on trains and dump it outside some town in Alabama. And I mean, how do you the garbage out? goes into tips or otherwise it goes out to sea. Yeah. And I don't, I, 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 Yes, there's the line by Upton Sinclair, it's hard to make a man understand something when his job depends on him not understanding it, which I've extended to. It's hard to make people understand something when their entitlement depends on them not understanding it. But for crying out loud, it's... Yeah, I think it's a combination of the indoctrination being very effective. And then I remember um, one of your lines, you said that the lies don't have to be particularly believable. They just have to act like the barriers to that hard truth that no one wants to accept. Well, thank you for that. And I, yes, and even though I wrote that line, I still don't get it. <laughs> it's just, you know, with, when, when stolid scientists are saying the oceans could be devoid of fish within 30 years, you'd think People, it's like years ago, I remember back in 1990 or so, I read this, uh, it's a female toxicologist, I don't remember who she was, she's really famous. Anyway, um, she said, I don't understand why people are not running around screaming because the entire world is being bathed in endocrine disruptors. It's, I mean, I understand that we get access to ice cream 24-7, and I understand that, you know, I can watch a bunch of baseball games, and I like watching baseball. But for crying out loud, it's it's. Well, you you cannot explain an addiction, like with rational terms. And the the people you're talking about, which is the majority of us, are addicted to this global industrialized and militarized civilization, and that's that's where you are. You know, thank you, thank you for saying that, and that is so true. And I have in my life known, I've known some drug addicts that, oh, I used to teach at a prison, and one of my students there, we had a really interesting discussion about it one time. He said, okay, uh, meth was his drug of choice. He said, meth has cost me my family, it's cost me the love of my life, it cost me my children, it cost me, he loved riding, motor, he, was a motor, he was a motorcycle gang person. He said, it cost me my motorcycle, it cost me ever riding a motorcycle again, it cost me my freedom, I will be in here for the rest of my life, and if you put a rock down there on the table, I would take it right now. And yeah, I love all, the fact, addiction, ahead, addiction. addiction comes from trauma, and addiction and trauma come the trauma of, our, of, of the trauma of the human beings come from this civilization it's traumatizing so you get more and more you get into the vicious circle of getting more and more addicted to all the products of technology because of this trauma so we we have we have discussed that in our group and uh, a lot and uh, we have we have other other topics that we we're looking at the time we've got only 10 12 minutes left 
So I want to I want to say one thing about that. Two things about that, real quick. One of them is I love the fact that the word addict comes from the same root as to enslave, mm -hmm. because in ancient Rome, a judge would issue an edict enslaving someone, and uh, when you're an addict, you are enslaved to whatever it is. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is central to all of my work, and one of the things that makes my work a bit different than, than many people's is the understanding that the problems we face are not fundamentally rational and therefore not soluble by rational means. And in fact, we say that in Bright Green Lies. We, we end, we start, I think it's the concluding chapter, or it's one of the chapters near the end. We start by saying, this book is based on a false premise. And the false premise is that when given, people make decisions based upon the best available evidence. And this is, of course, nonsense. Um, people primarily use their intelligence to rationalize doing whatever it was that they wanted to do before, um, which again takes it back to the addiction. Okay, so now I'll shut up and you can go with some well, questions. Can I just, I'll hand over to you, Sophie, but um, I, I just want to encourage you, um, Derek, on the line of, you know, taking this line that you can't reason with people with uh, with an addiction, but one of the emotional triggers that, uh, that you got absolutely right uh, with Bright Green Lies, at least Julia Barnes did in the movie, is your... Uh, when you talk about how capitalism and industrial society takes living things and makes them into dead things for for profit, I think that is very very powerful. There's, I mean, I've I've said it myself a bit, but I haven't said it with as much emphasis as as you guys have. And and I think that is something that's hugely powerful. Is that our system takes uh, you know land. And uses agriculture to turn it into dead stuff. It takes fish out of the sea, and they only into the GDP when they're dead. So it's a fetishization of all these dead things like Wi-Fi and cell phones and silicon and computers and virtual reality and TV. They're all dead. You know, if you have a virtual reality experience, the notable thing for me is it's a dead world. It's a stale yep. dead world if you put on VR glasses and, and go into that world. And so you know, it's really a biblical thing of, you know, saying like, choose life, choose life. You completely in our society that takes a dead thing and turns it into a living thing. But that's what the, the nature that I remember viscerally from my childhood in Africa, all out in the felt is what you're conscious of is if anything dies, a million things crowd in and turn it into living things. Yep. yep. <laughs> it's the exact the opposite original. of what we do. Yep. Yep, completely agree. Um, and that's, you know, it's, it, there's one of my, so my mom died three years ago and I inherited her dogs and they were brother and sister who'd been from obviously the same litter. And um, so they were together their whole life. And then one of them died about a month and a half ago. And I didn't know what to do with the body um, because I didn't want it cremated. And I didn't want to put it in the forest because uh, she liked the meadow right here. And then finally I realized what I wanted to do with the body is to put it, um, there was a heather plant that she loved to sleep on because she loved the smell. So I put her there on the heather. And over the last month and a half or however, she's been about three quarters consumed now. And... I get a little bit freaked out about it because the UPS guy came up and he has to walk right past there. And I keep thinking he's going to like report me to the cops or something because I have a dead dog on my, you know, right outside the house. But this is, so I freak out about that a little bit. But the point is that this is completely natural. This is what is supposed to happen. That when this is like the final screw you that our culture gives to the planet is that when you die, you you don't actually even give back then. I remember years ago, I read this, this article about this guy who raped and murdered his daughter. And he was sent to prison for life, which he should be. But the thing that annoyed me was the judge said, not only did you rape and kill her, but you left her body out to be devoured by wolves. And it's like, that's actually the good part, you know? that that. That, I mean, everything else is horrible. I'm not making light of, 
of what what he did to her. But once she's dead, she should feed. You know, that's you know they they kidnapped kidnapped stole whatever it is Edward Abbey's body from the mortuary or from the morgue or wherever and took him out in the desert and nobody knows what well except for the people who did it they don't know where his body is because they he wanted to become part of the desert and when I die I hope that civilization has crashed enough that there's I mean I fully recognize the the health problems especially in a city of just you know putting bodies out but I live in the country that's why I didn't mind with the dog I want to do the same thing with myself I I I want you know if if when I go I want to be eaten by the bears and the carrion beetles and everybody else. I want to be part of the forest. Yeah, it's kind of a way of living on. So we've only got three minutes left, and I can see Sophie's itching. Um, but uh, no, no, you you go on. No, no, no. I'm just looking at the clock. I'm doing the recording. Carry on. <laughs> okay, uh, Derek. There's there's so many things that I feel I'd like to. Well, we can do it again. This is. Um, can we do it again? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Let's do it again. Yeah, and because there there are a number of topics that I think uh, we should go over, and also some some well, ideas. Also, I would never talk about solutions for one thing. Yeah. So, so in terms of solutions, um, well. I want. Uh, I, I said the same thing to Leah Keith, but I, I, I want to say to you is you've got to get on and do the next book because what's coming on fast is geoengineering. Is these uh, you know once you have the engineering mindset, everything is a problem that you can solve with engineering. <laughs> it's like yeah, you know, uh, and um, you know okay. the I have a and stuff in the Arctic. It's all coming, and uh, you know so we we you know. You've just addressed bright green lies, and the next big thing is geoengineering. So please get on and start working on you know something about that. Well, what I was going to say is, you know, I have a degree in engineering, and it um, they taught us how to do things, but part of the problem is they never asked, should this thing be done? And that's a huge problem in engineering. Is, I mean. To use a fairly extreme example, they can ask, well, these are all extreme. They can ask, how do you, they had a problem in Nazi Germany of how do you, that the people who were shooting Jews face to face were having terrible psychological trauma of just having to murder all these people. So that's what they, 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 that's why they invented the mobile killing bands. So they don't have to see anything. So it's an engineering problem. How do we do this? And then they would, how do you handle the contents of the van? They would slope it so bodily fluids would, would, would flow to a drain. These are all engineering problems. We can say the same thing about damming rivers, which is killing rivers. We can say the same thing about building bombs. It's, you know, I wrote an entire book about human supremacism that we think we're so smart. And, you know, I didn't want to, and I don't think we are particularly smart, smarter. And... And the thing that was interesting to me is that where I came to, it's like humans do have a gift that bears don't have. What is it? And it really is just for creating gizmos. You know, we're really good at creating gadgets. And that doesn't make us superior to anybody. But unfortunately, the question is not asked ever or very rarely asked, should we be making an electric car? Should we be making a road? Should we be making pavement? We just ask how to make it, and then we figure out better ways to make it, and then we figure out better ways to do something else. But nobody ever asks, do we actually need this much energy? Or, or the thing that bugs me is, uh, you know, with this kind of millenarian hopium, is that nobody ever says how to back it out. Everybody goes like, oh, we have the aeroplane. That's a fantastic new invention. We have the car. We have the vaccine. And nobody ever says, okay, what happens if we want to unravel that? So you can say, okay, we have, we, we can now have CRISPR and we can do gene editing. And nobody ever says, wait, wait, before you start doing that, tell us how you unravel it if it doesn't go as you think. No, so one, not no one says that. It's I'm not yeah. taking my fantastic head at you. stuff that we can do now. And it's like, are we going to do it or not? It's like, no, let's say, can you unravel it? 
that's what you need to ask. Can you undo the damage if this goes wrong? What's the mitigation strategy? No one does that. They assume that everything's wonderful and there's never going to be a downside, but there's always 10 downsides for every innovation. So I'm not shaking my head in disgust at what you said. I'm shaking my head in disgust at the concept because it is so true. I mean, we never... So in my book, Culture Make-Believe, uh, I did a chapter on Bhopal and there was a line by one of the activists, you know, Bhopal was where somewhere between 8,000 and 100,000 people died um, because of a, yeah, a pesticide factory exploded and spewed poison across the town. And the, the point is there was this one activist who said afterwards, no one should be allowed to make a poison for which there is no antidote. Or to put it even more prosaically, I learned as a five-year-old, my mother taught me, do not make messes that you cannot clean up. But it's, it's, it kills me that they're doing open-air experiments. Yeah, th this, is, this is exactly the point. Sorry to butt in, but it's so important, I feel. It's like they... Um, you know, there's Peter Wadhams and these people I really respect are starting to talk about things like putting microspherules in, uh, you know, little glass beads in on the Arctic ice to basically increase its albedo. Um, now, they just say, should we do this or not? But no one asked the question is, how do you get that out, out of the Arctic if it doesn't work like you think? They all so, make assumptions, but they never say how they can get rid of that stuff if it doesn't work. So earlier in the conversation, I mentioned the rats by the side of the pond, and the pond has no inlet, no outlet, and has lots of frogs. And when I moved here, and don't think ill of my mom for this, it was just an offhand suggestion. My mom said, why don't you get some goldfish and put them in the pond? And I answered because it's a lot easier to not put goldfish in than it is to get them out if there's too many. That's it, that's everything. We're getting really close to when you have to yeah. leave, in fact you do. have it. So so can I leave on this note and just say that in, in terms of uh, uh, mitigation and the importance of mitigation, especially when it comes to geoengineering, it's really subtle. One of the things that uh, responses that, that we got on social media to Bright Green Lies is uh, the particular thing where you just give an allusion to the fact that basically we should use active measures, which people don't like. Um, and so... Watching know, the movie people, myself... You, um, you, you um, gave it a little hint. Lier and I were watching it, sitting next to each other on the, on, on the same computer. And um, when that line came up, I turned to Lier and said, that's where we lost everybody. Anyway, but go ahead. It's necessary. It, it is true. Oh, so I really thank you for saying it. But but here's, here's the subtle thing. The response that people get, people that get the movie and get where it's going, is you always get this response, which is, says, yes, okay, we get it. Um, I, I, I posted a very easy way, legal, in fact, to bring the grid down. Uh, through mass action. It was very, very easy. The The biggest response people have to it is millions of people are going to die. If the grid goes down, millions of people are going to die. And you see what's happening is uh, the system is taking hostages because it's making, through trauma and through uh, ill health, it's making people dependent on modern medicine and things like that. So, so then you know, as time goes on, they're more, if you look at, say, people that are wheel, wheelchair bound, and, and in uh, in Britain, it's going up very steeply. There are more and more people that need civilization to, to survive. So if you flick the switch on civilization, a lot of people are going to die. That number is increasing, and it's increasing because of the industrial disease is increasing. So we're in this kind of positive feedback loop where the system is taking hostages that are now dependent on it to the extent that you can't flick the grid. So, you know, I, I think it's so important that, again, nobody says, well, you know, when you make a wheelchair is, can you 
can do you have a strategy for for removing wheelchairs from society and you don't because people will flip their they'll do their head and if you say we're going to you know stop having any one of these modern miracles for, of of modern medicine and so so everybody puts these miracles of modern medicine in and nobody says how to withdraw them once the the public is dependent on them so sorry to go on so long and keep you over no i think i want to end on that note okay my memory is crap these days so i'll forget but um please do uh remember for the next time we do this um to talk about that and addiction more uh because that's something that's been thrown at me for for decades and i have a good response it's just too long for now um, yeah, sorry to. Well, it's good to live, leave on a cliffhanger. Uh, yeah, thank cliffhanger. you so much. I'll take Tune notes next time. for the next meeting. Definitely, we'll bring back. We'll have a. We'll, we'll get in touch with you again. Um, we'd really like to listen to you again. Thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you so yeah, much. Thanks. Your questions are great. Yeah, thank you, Derek, and thank you for your work. Oh, yeah, thank, thank you so much.